Hello and welcome everybody to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where today we are going to take a dive under the ocean to get a look at the world's most fascinating and amazing aquatic animals. And no, I'm not talking about Caleb Dressel and Katie Ledecky, who are impressive in their own right. I'm talking about sharks, and we have the perfect teacher here to teach you all about the amazing world of sharks. Andy Casagrande here, you may recognize him from Shark Week or from National Geographic. He's an Emmy-winning producer of all kinds of amazing animal films, including all kinds of up close and personal films where he dives down to get to know sharks personally. He's going to tell you all about that. So get excited here. A couple things before we turn it over to him. One, he's going to tell you sharks do bite, but not as much as you might think. And, uh, and Andy definitely doesn't. So make sure you're talking to him often. You're going to see there's a chat box to the right of the screen there. It says ask on it. That's where you can ask Andy any questions you have about sharks. He's also going to ask you a lot of questions. We want you to use that same field to answer his questions as well. This is going to be really interactive to find out what you know about sharks and what you want to know about sharks. So answer his questions there throughout the class. Don't wait until the end. Ask your questions. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to interview Andy with your questions to get you as many shark answers as possible. I'll make also, sorry, make sure you've got a camera nearby because we're going to give everybody an opportunity in about a half an hour to lean into the screen and get a shark selfie with, uh, with Andy there. If you upload that to Instagram and tag Andy Casagrande and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a pretty cool prize package that includes some shark swag from Andy. It's going to be autographed. There's a cool hat that's got the same logo as his shirt there. Uh, cool shark picture in there. And you'll be entered to win also a, a trip to Varsity Tutors Wildlife Creature Camp. There's a link on your screen to learn more. So amazing prizes there. Plus, you just get a selfie with Andy and maybe some shark, uh, shark themed stuff as well. So get excited for that. Have a camera nearby. Keep it interactive. And with all that said, I think it's time to turn it over to your teacher for today, shark expert, Andy Casagrande. What's up, guys? I am super excited. This is my very, very first online shark course. And I couldn't be more happy because my favorite thing on the planet, as you may or may not know, are sharks. And there's so many incredible things I want to teach you about. We're going to play some games. We're going to do some trivia. There's going to be lots of facts and stats, and I just can't wait to get started. Are you guys pumped? Let's do this. All right, so we're going to kick this off here first with the agenda. Today's deep sea agenda is section one is going to be fin fact versus fin fiction, essentially myth busting for sharks. Section two is going to be getting to know sharks. Lots of cool data, different facts, and things you may or may not know about sharks. Section three is shark safety for you. A lot of people are freaked out by sharks. They're scared. They don't want to go in the ocean. They won't even go in their swimming pool because they think sharks are going to eat them. I'm going to help you over overcome that fear and understand how you can be safe in the ocean and coexist with sharks. Section four is just as important, if not more, as shark safety for sharks. Sharks are actually in trouble, and there's many things we can do to help them, keep them safer because they're critically important. I'll tell you more about that later. Section five is going to be some selfies and some Q&A, and the whole thing is going to be epic, so let's get started. All right, the first thing is section one, fin fact versus fin fiction. Let's play a game. All right, first one, fact or fiction. Sharks don't have great eyesight, so they hunt using an incredible sense of smell. They can smell a drop of blood from far, far away. Fact or fiction? All right, lots of answers coming in. Fact, fact, fiction, fact. All right, lots of, uh, it's kind of almost a 50-50. The reality is that is fiction. Sharks actually have incredible eyesight. All different species have different levels of, you know, eyesight acuity. But like great whites are my favorite and they're very visual hunters. They have really good eyesight, very developed eyes, and they're good at hunting in very low light levels. And they need big meals. They eat tuna. They eat seals. They eat dolphins. I know people don't like when I say sharks eat dolphins, but dolphins eat a lot of fish and a lot of other things. And the reality is white sharks use visual hunting because they need a big meal and it's easier to see when they're cruising down the See that silhouette and you see them breaking out of the water. It is incredible. And they're using their sight. They have many other senses, but they seem to primarily use visual hunting because they need to hunt big prey. And the second one here is fact or fiction. Sharks are eating machines. They look to eat anything that they might think is food. Fact or fiction. 
All right. Sharks are not out to get us. That's good. My dad says sharks will eat me. Okay. We've got to talk to your dad here. The reality is it is fiction. If sharks were out to eat us and, and they had a taste for human blood, we would literally be consumed every day by sharks anytime we went in the water because they are incredible predators. They're super agile, super fast, very maneuverable, very smart, and they can sneak up on us without us even knowing it. So if sharks were really out to get us, we would know about it because every single day, one of your friends would go disappear or someone else. So the reality is they're actually very picky predators. Uh, there's certain like tiger sharks, they're a bit more like generalists. They'll eat a variety of things, but most species specialize in a certain prey item or a variety of prey items. So humans, they've even done tests with human blood and fish blood and trying to attract sharks with both side by side. The sharks almost have no response to human blood. It's such a foreign thing to them that it's just not really on their radar or their menu. Yes, occasionally sharks make mistakes. There's mistaken identity bites, but most of them are bite and spit. They're like, oh, that didn't taste very good. They're more interested in things that are naturally on their menu. And like I said, each species kind of specializes in different prey items. Just like you might like pizza, this guy might like uh, peanut butter. This guy wants to eat an impossible burger or whatever it is. We all have different tastes and sharks do too. All right, here we continue here with Fin Fact versus Fin Fiction. Sharks can smell fear. I get this question all the time. If I'm scared in the water, will sharks smell my fear? Okay, if you pee or poo yourself, the shark will probably smell that, but likely it will be repelled. I mean, sharks, like most animals, aren't really into that stuff. The reality is sharks cannot smell your fear, but what they can do is interpret your reaction to your own fear. So if you're scared and you're freaking out and you're splashing around and you're trying to swim away and you're panicked, you will often heighten the set, the set, heighten the shark's um, senses. It'll it'll start to get faster. It'll start to get excited. It'll say, "What's going on?" Because most prey items in the ocean that are being hunted by sharks are trying to get away. So it almost triggers this instinct for the shark to chase you. So they can't smell your fear, but they'll pick up on it if you're super freaked out and fearful and you're panicked and erratic. The sharks can get that way as well. If you stay calm, if you're zenned out and everything's cool and you're coexisting and you're peaceful, the sharks often reciprocate and they maintain that like cool level of, uh, they're super polite. I've been diving with sharks on almost every continent, nearly, I, I was gonna say every species, but there's, there's over 500. I mean, every day I read a different number, there's 1200s or this, that, because you can also include skates and stingrays and different species in, in, in a similar category. But the reality is sharks, if you stay calm, um, you, you're going to be okay. And, and I've done it with great whites outside of the cage. People always think I'm crazy. Aren't you afraid they're going to eat you? Don't you get scared? I mean, it's a calculated risk. I think about it, but if I got scared, it would be, it would be a bad thing. It would basically uh, cause me to react in a way where I'm starting to act like prey. And, and I never do that. I, I, I respect them. They respect me. And if I do get freaked out and I feel like, Ah, maybe this isn't the right time. The visibility is dropping. The lo light levels are lower. That shark's a little bit interested too much. Then I slowly and calmly exit the water and everything's cool. So that's sort of my advice. They can't, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the question is. Sorry, I, I sort of just went on that tangent there, but let's continue and get on to the next one. All right, fact or fiction. Sharks lose and replace thousands of teeth in their lifetimes. All right, okay, yes, yes, fact, fact. Everyone's pretty much getting this right, yes. Sharks have this like conveyor belt of teeth. They, it's an endless supply of teeth and the reality is like they don't have hands, they don't have arms. So everything they do really has to be touched first with their mouth. So if they wanna just test an object, they use their teeth. If they bite down on something hard, they can break their teeth out. If they were like humans and after they lost their baby teeth, they had no teeth left, Sharks would not survive very long. There'd be a lot of grandma sharks out there. Not all grandmas have no teeth, but what I'm saying is uh, they do. They're able to have this unlimited supply of teeth and each shark species has a unique different design and set of teeth. Like tiger sharks have these teeth that are like can openers so they can 
uh, attack and eat turtles. And I know not everyone likes to hear little turtles getting eaten, but sharks got to eat too. And turtles eat jellyfish. So if you like jellyfish, but anyway, the bottom line is they do have this endless supply of teeth and it's incredible. We're going to go on to the next one here. Fact or fiction. Sharks have to be constantly swimming in order to breathe through their gills. A lot of people. Okay. Let's see. Yes, they do. I saw it on shark week. All right. What about the ones on the bottom? Exactly. Not all sharks are required to swim to oxygenate their bodies. There's actually this thing called buccal pumping. Nurse sharks do it. This is not a nurse shark, but they basically open and close their mouth and they're flushing oxygenated water through their gills. You can see the gill slits here. And great whites like this one actually prefer ram ventilation where they swim their mouth is slightly open and they're pushing oxygenated water through their gills. So not all sharks need to swim. And just speaking of great whites, researchers that actually have caught great whites for science to tag them, to study them, and have put them in small, um, small little pools, basically a baby pool, they've seen great whites buccal pumping where they're actually moving their jaws up and down as well and pumping. But also the researchers will often put a hose with oxygenated water to help them out because they do prefer ram ventilation. But it's just proof that every single shark species out there is adapted in these amazing ways to survive. And whether it's buccal pumping or ram ventilation, they get plenty of oxygen from the oceans. Luckily, we can get it from the land. If you wanna breathe underwater, you gotta get a scuba tank, a rebreather, or breath hold free dive works too, but you gotta be good at that. So sharks can breathe underwater, different formats. It's awesome. Let's keep going here. All right, section two, getting to know sharks. Here we go. What is a word you would use to describe sharks? Scary, big, strong, fast, majestic. There we go. Magnificent. I love that. I use all those same words. Maybe not scary. I mean, as a kid, when I saw sharks for the first time, it was on television and I, was, I actually thought they were fake. I literally, you know how your parents tell you, don't always believe everything you see on TV. If Superman jumps off a bridge and flies, you shouldn't do that because it's make believe, right? I saw a shark for the first time on television and I also thought it was make believe. And um, in reality, when I learned that they were real, um, it was it just blew my mind. And I'm sorry, I lost my track. Can you pop that slide up again? Because I forget even what the question is. I get so excited that I forget um, what I'm saying here. But the reality is um, it was uh, words that we use to describe sharks. Amazing, epic, incredible. And sharks have unique personalities. So we name a lot of sharks, a lot of sharks, great whites, tigers. They have names. There was a shark off the coast here in Florida where I live named Nova, tagged in Nova Scotia, and it swam all the way down here into the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> and we name sharks sometimes just on their personality, sometimes on the way they look. A couple sharks will have big scars. We have this one shark we call Scarface. Another one that we call Rainbow, just because it's always happy and chill. Other ones that we, we occasionally name a shark Psycho because they act super crazy and they're super amped up. But the bottom line is the point to this whole thing is they have personalities, unique personalities, and they're all different. So it's really cool coming up with different names. And over the years, uh, I was recently in Australia, I encountered these two great white shark brothers, and they were incredible. And I, I named them Tom and Jerry. And then later I thought, wait, Tom is like a, a cat and Jerry's a mouse and they're totally different sizes. So not a great name, but it popped into my head. The bottom line is um, there's a lot of ways to describe sharks, but I hope you guys agree that demons monsters devils you know bloodthirsty villains are not the words we should use to describe sharks sometimes the media likes to you know hype it up a bit to get you to watch but the reality is they're majestic they're polite they're beautiful i i'm living proof i've dived with great white sharks out of the cage in almost 17 locations around the world and i have never been bit i have all my fingers all my toes people say i don't have all my brain cells but i do and uh anyway sharks amazing let's you subscribe let's keep going you guys having fun you guys having fun yes all right here we go next one is shark stats this is cool because facts and science 
are really what we need to rely on to understand sharks better. Not just what you see on TV or even sometimes what you read in books and magazines. It's always good to fact check. So here we're gonna go through some shark stats. I'm gonna take a sip of water here too. All right. The smallest shark grows to about the size of a what? A button, a banana, a baseball bat, or a bathtub? All right, a baseball bat. That was a good guess. A button, that'd be a little micro shark. Banana, you got it. Actually, the smallest shark in the world is called, is called the dwarf lantern shark. Check it out right there. It literally fits in the palm of your hand like this one. This is like a, obviously a great white replica. And it's even a bit bigger than the dwarf lantern shark there. But these dwarf lantern sharks are incredible. They only get to about six to eight inches, the size of a banana. And they live in the deep blue sea, but not the deep blue sea, the deep dark sea, because they live so deep. It's very dark down there. And actually, the cool thing about these sharks is that they glow in the dark. They literally have developed these things called photophores that are little tiny things along their gills and their bellies and their, their fins, <coughs> not their gills, their bellies and their fins, where they can emit light and glow in the dark. And they're thought to use that to attract little, little things that they eat or potentially repel things. But when you see a glowing light in the dark, it's kind of like, you know, fireflies flying around at night. You, you're like drawn to them. You want to check it out. And when you're a tiny little shark like that, I guess you need to use whatever you can to bring in the food to you because chasing around things in the ocean down there in the dark can be challenging. But if you use light and you bring them into you, they might bump right into you, grab a snack and you're good to go. All right, so the dwarf lantern shark, smallest shark in the world. Uh, here we go. The largest shark can grow to be as long as what? A bicycle, a school bus, a bowling lane or a football field. All right. School bus. School bus. You guys are into the school thing here. I've heard school bus a lot too myself. All right. The bowling lane, actually. The biggest shark, in fact, the biggest fish in the world is the whale shark. These guys can grow up to 60 feet long. That is massive. That is as long as a bowling lane. I know it's a strange analogy. And, you know, uh, I don't go bowling a whole lot. But when I visualize a whale shark laid out, maybe not laid out, maybe there's a bowling lane underwater. And I've dived with whale sharks. I was just in the Galapagos diving with pregnant female whale sharks. And it is just mind blowing. Seriously, it's hard to fathom something that big. Actually, and the blue whales are amazing. They're, they're huge too, but they're mammals, different category. Whale sharks, and they have these amazing spot patterns. <coughs> Scientists use these spot patterns to actually identify different sharks. It's incredible. And when you swim alongside one, it makes you feel so small because you are so small compared to a whale shark. And we're going to talk a bit more about these guys, but they're one of my favorite sharks because they're gentle giants. And a really cool fact about whale sharks that I just learned myself is that they have teeth on their eyes. They have dermal denticles, these little shields similar to their skin. It's like a protective armor because whale sharks, if something comes up to try to say attack them, if their eyes get injured, that's really bad. If any predator loses their eyes, especially predators that use their eyes to hunt and to find mates and to navigate and all that stuff, very bad if you had an eye injury. And if someone comes up to me and tries to punch me in the eye, I block it, right? Or you can put on sunglasses to protect yourself from the sun. Uh, whale sharks don't really have that luxury. They, they don't have the hands or sunglasses. So they've developed this amazing evolutionary trait, this adaptation to have teeth, dermal denticles on their eyeballs. <laughs> Every day I learn new stuff about sharks and it still blows my mind. And that's one thing I recommend to you. Learn something every day. Learn something new because it'll make you a better person. It'll make you smarter, faster. Uh, everything will be cooler. And you can teach your friends and make it contagious. If you tell your dad, hey, dad, you know what? Or mom, I just learned today that whale sharks have teeth on their eyeballs. They'll be like, son, you've been watching too much TV or whatever. It's true. Google it. Check it out. It's amazing. All right, we're gonna continue here with shark stats. The largest shark egg is about the size of a golf ball, tennis ball, basketball, or a beach ball. And which shark would it be? The largest shark egg is about the size of a beach ball. And guess what shark it is? 
We just talked about it. The whale shark. Whale sharks can have up to 300 pups, 300 babies at a time. Imagine 300 beach balls inside your body. I've seen a pregnant whale shark, like I said, recently in the Galapagos. And I could imagine 300 beach balls inside this thing because it was massive. And it's incredible to see all, all different sharks have a variety of pup sizes, like great whites from, from, from the research I've done from captured animals that have been caught in a net or something. They've pulled 14, some reports say 15 baby great white sharks out of a single mother. Tiger sharks can have up to 80 babies at a time. Imagine if your mom had 80 babies. <laughs> You'd need a big house. A lot of room, a lot of toys, and a lot of diapers. So anyway, the biggest um, shark egg in the world is the whale shark, beach ball size. All right, let's keep going. I hope you guys are liking this and learning some cool stuff. I'm excited. I, I feel like I'm learning stuff just talking about it. <clears throat> All right, getting to know sharks. Sharks can do a lot of amazing things but not all the amazing things. So which of the following is something sharks can do? A, use tools, B, math, C, walk, or D, build shelters. Now I know there's some random stuff going on in there. Sharks cannot do math, neither can I. I like that one, good one, all right. Sharks can use tools, okay, interesting. Uh, sharks can walk, that's it, it's true. Sharks can literally walk. You got to check this out right here. This is called the epaulet shark. They're found in Australia and they literally can walk on land. Look at this thing. It's using its fins literally as like feet to walk across the reef at low tide. And I, I just learned about these sharks relatively recently. And I'm just always blown away by these adaptations that the sharks have developed like they're walking on land. I mean, you hear about, you know, pigs can fly and this and that. Actually, sharks can fly. Great whites can jump out of the water and these sharks can walk on land. So, I mean, people often say, um, well, you know, I never really knew about these sharks until, like I said, I, I started studying them. And people, the only sharks that I thought walked on land were land sharks, which we refer to as humans. Um, but in reality, this shark can walk on land. It's called the epaulet shark. Google it. You can check out more things about it. They're cute. They're cuddly. And they can walk on land. Amazing. Let's keep going here. All right. We're continuing with getting to know sharks here. Shark senses. Humans have five senses. We all know, right? We have sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, right? How many senses do sharks have? All right, 18, that's a good guess. Seven, that's my lucky number. I do like that. Six, all right. So sharks actually have an additional sense that we don't have and it's called electroreception. And that sense is basically like these amazing little pores on the shark's snout called the ampullae of Lorenzini. The perfect example are the hammerheads. <clears throat> hammerheads have a cephalofoil, which is basically the hammer on the top of their head. And if you look closely at it, you can see all these little dots. And these dots are these jelly-filled sacs that have little, uh, they lead back to the brain where they, they are giving the shark, picking, allowing it to pick up minute electrical, uh, electrical fields, electrical impulses underwater. So I've seen hammerheads cruising along this featureless sandy bottom just cruising along, but they're like hovering right over above the sand, like a metal detector. And then suddenly they'll flip around, spin around and start to dig into the sand and they'll pull a stingray out of the sand that was hiding completely, not able to see it, but they felt it. It's incredible. And I'm actually working on a new show about electroreception and sharks. <laughs> And it's amazing. Imagine if you could feel, uh, you know, you're walking down and like, oh, I, well, look, I found a penny or a, a nickel or a quarter or whatever. You could detect things or you a battery, whatever it is. It's amazing that these sharks and great whites, a lot of sharks have these ampullae of Lorenzini. I would think all of them, but don't quote me on that, but they use them for a variety of different uh, things. Some have more sensitive, some less, um, but either way, they have this electro sense, the one that we don't have. And Real quick, there's thought that they might even have like thermal pit receptors and they have lateral lines that can detect minute vibrations. We can kind of you must have to feel it. But anyway, uh, I'll keep going here. Uh, I can talk forever about sharks, but uh, let's keep going. All right, the next one here is 
<laughs> all right, here we go. Section three, shark safety for you. I'll get this question all the time. If I go in the water, are sharks going to eat me? How do I know if sharks are there? How do I know if it's a sharky place? I always tell people the best way to determine whether there are sharks in the area is take your finger, put it in the water, and taste it. If you taste salt, unless you're in the Dead Sea, if you taste salt, sharks are most likely there. Sharks live in the oceans. They live in all, in all oceans, and they're amazing. I mean, great whites have been found in Hawaii and as far up as Alaska. They're incredibly adaptable. So you're going to find them pretty much everywhere, and it's important to understand how to be safe. One of my number one rules is like to, to not swim in super murky water because sharks thrive at hunting in murky water. And if you're in an area where you know there's sharks, you know there's prey items that they could be hunting, and there's really turbid or murky water, it's, you know, it's not always super smart to be swimming and splashing around in super murky water. So one way to keep yourself safe is don't dive in really murky water. Try not to go into the ocean totally alone. Um, you know, there's all these myths about like, um, yeah, if I, if I pee, are the sharks going to smell? Are they going to come and get me? What can I do to stay safe in the water? The reality is they're out there. They're not out to get us. Occasionally they make mistakes. Surfers are sometimes investigated or attacked by sharks. I don't like to use the word attack because um, it's more of the, it's, it's, some, it's sometimes mistaken identity. Sometimes it is a hungry shark. They're not really attacking you. They're just, they're, they're trying to survive. So the reality is there are many ways to stay safe. Um, you, diving in clear water, areas where you know there's not a ton of different sharks. And also um, don't dive where people are like fishing or putting bait in the water, or you see big swarms of fish and bait and you see fins jumping out of the water. Like, you wouldn't like run across a firing range, right? Like when people are, anyway, uh, I'm rambling here, but uh, let's keep going here. Staying safe with sharks. Also, it's just don't panic. If you do encounter a shark, maintain eye contact. And, and you know, usually they're going to swim away. If it does try to make contact, keep the teeth from touching you, which is sounds hard, but you can actually push sharks away, deflect them. And usually once they realize you're not what they thought you were, they, they usually leave you alone. So if, if they don't slowly, quietly try to get out of the water, you're going to be okay because the likelihood of them and the, the investigations, the attacks on humans are so, so rare. You, you're more worried about, you know, driving in cars and all the other stuff. But anyway, here we go. Who should be more scared of shark human encounters, sharks or humans? So the reality is, we are way, way more dangerous to sharks than sharks are to us. That's just a fact. As I mentioned, attacks on humans are very, very rare, generally in the single digits per year. Um, and the attacks on sharks, the amount of sharks that we kill or harvest every year for their fins and for their liver oil and everything is in the hundreds of millions. And that's not sustainable. Like it, it, it's also just not right. Um, so sharks are in much more danger from human attack than the other way around. And I think the only way to get around that is through education and teaching people why sharks are important. Why should I care about sharks? They're just crazy monsters that want to eat me in the sea. No, it's not true. Sharks are incredibly important. They're like, it's hard to explain that to someone that lives far away from the ocean. Why do I care about sharks? I live uh, in, uh, in Nebraska or, or wherever you live or in the middle of a landlocked um, country. The reality is over 70% of the oxygen we breathe, over 70% comes from the oceans. And the only way to have a healthy ocean is to have a sharky ocean. And why is that? Is because sharks actually maintain this critical balance. And they, they actually hunt things that are are um, not on their game, so to speak. It helps keep a, a very competitive, healthy environment in the ocean. And if you remove all the sharks, imagine if you removed all the sh tiger sharks from an area, all the turtles in that area that the tigers were feeding on would be like, oh, nothing's gonna eat me now. I'm gonna eat all the seagrass I can, all the everything I can, all the seagrass disappears. That's habitat for smaller fish. So there's these cascade effects that happen if you remove these top predators and it's just not good. And they're also in danger, obviously, because of thinning and overfishing. There's a, you know, this shark fin soup thing. It's just, it's not good. And actually sharks are very toxic. Toxic, a lot of big predators, particularly sharks, they're at the top of the food chain, right? When you're eating all these other smaller fish, you're accumulating a lot of toxins. So if you eat shark in a lot of places around the world, we now know the oceans are, are unfortunately full of plastic. They're full of different pollutants. There's ocean acidification. I'm not trying to 
depress you here. I'm not trying to, you know, freak you out, but you need to know about this because your everyday decisions really affect the overall health of the planet. So things like that um, really also affect sharks. And um, yeah, it's just kind of, uh, we, we need to learn to coexist with these animals and I know we can. Awesome. Hey, thank you for ending on that note too. Sharks are really amazing. And, uh, and it's kind of us up to us to, uh, to appreciate them, to do what we can to help them out. So, uh, so huge thanks for that. And actually that leads me into one a huge thanks. Andy. this was, uh, this is great. I, I love the number of times I was trying to, you know, keep track of where you said, I could talk about sharks all day. We're going to let you because we've got some questions coming up. So if, uh, you know, right. if there were times where you thought like, oh, I want to talk more about sharks, your time is coming. All of you out there, uh, we've got a little bit of an interstitial break here to remind you, keep your questions coming in because we're going to have some time over the next 15 minutes or so to get you as many answers as we can and get those cameras ready. Um, so as you're getting your cameras ready, remember, we're going to give you a chance in a second, lean into the screen, get a selfie with uh, with Andy. If you do that and upload it to Instagram, we'll have our official handles up there. Tag Andy, tag Varsity Tutors. You'll be entered to win a prize package that includes a membership in Wildlife Creature Camp with Varsity Tutors, that exact hat there, which is so cool, um, and an autographed uh, shark card there. We get uh, you know some, some images of amazing sharks and, uh, and of, uh, of Andy's videography and uh, things you may know from Shark Week and everything. So um, now I think we've given you enough time to, uh, to log into those phones and, uh, and make sure that whatever row of teeth you're on, uh, they're, uh, they're pearly white and ready to smile. So Andy, I'm going to throw it back to you full screen. Let's get everybody excited for this picture. All right, guys, let's do this. And you got to tag me on Instagram. And like I said, uh, we're going to, we're going to autograph the hat. It's a cool picture. I'll throw in some stickers. You're going to become my pal. You can hit me up anytime. Ask me any other questions you have. And let's get some selfies. <laughs> I hope you guys like this class. This was a lot of fun for me. I uh, well, so you've seen the comments rolling through. You were kind of picking up people's answers to your questions. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say uh, a lot of people love this class. So thanks so much. Uh, hopefully everybody loved those pictures. We always love checking those out on Instagram. Remember those uh, official rules, handles, all that will be up on a slide at the end. And if you want to learn more about Wildlife Future Camp, there's a link on your screen. One of you will win that plus the hat, the stickers uh, and the autographs. Um, but everybody else has the ability to join. So, uh, so check out that link and uh, we hope to see you there soon. While we're also talking about things upcoming, Andy's going to be back a little bit later in the fall to uh, to talk about how to, uh, to you know, photograph and video and animals in the wild and capture all those cool things that he does. So uh, if you enjoyed this class, there's plenty more where that came from through Wildlife Future Camp, through Andy's upcoming classes uh, and all kinds of other things. Um, but it's time for questions. You guys have had some really amazing questions and that kind of fell into different, you know, kind of like thematic genres. So our first one, uh, and a lot of people ask different variations of this. What's your favorite shark? Um, you know, and those kind of things. My favorite one that someone asks is if you could be a shark, what type of shark would you be? So I'm going to ask it that way. Really, we want to know, you know, what are your favorite sharks? And if you could be one, what type of shark would you be, Andy? Wow, that is a good question. I've never been asked that, which, what kind of shark I would be. I actually, though, I have a song called If I Was a Great White Shark. Uh, and it, well, it's called The Great White Shark Song. You can check it out on YouTube. And it basically talks about what I would do if I was a great white and I have to say, uh, out of all the shark species, it is, if I could be any shark, I would be a great white shark. Uh, they're just, they're just incredible and their personalities are so unique. So for me, um, I know all the other sharks are cool too. There's even a, a ninja lantern shark. There's all these cool sharks, a goblin shark, a mega mouth shark, and maybe a mega mouth because they're, they're quite rare. Uh, they haven't really been showcased a whole lot. So if I couldn't be a great white shark, I would be a mega mouth. And I talk a lot, so that, that might make sense. <laughs> Exactly. Sort of like you, you have nicknames for sharks. You know, you sort of evolve into a, a type of shark as well. Hey, and that leads to another one. So, you, you know, you've uh, gone down and, and, and um, dove, dive in. What's the, what's the past tense of that? I think dove. Dive, um, so, dove yeah, yeah. I heard dove. You've been on dives with sharks of, uh, of all different types there. If everybody knows the actual, uh, I feel embarrassed we don't know that type, that one in. Um, and especially, you know, great whites. I think we all, you know, like you said, we're trained, movies like Jaws, all that, we're kind of trained to fear them. So a lot of people want 
wanted to know, you know, how did you get started diving? And really, what was it like that first time you were in the ocean? There's a great white out there and you see it. Can you tell us what was that like that first time? Yeah, the first time was actually pretty intense. Actually, it was in South Africa. The water there is very cold. It's very murky for the most part. Don't get me wrong. You get days where it's crystal clear and beautiful and a bit warmer. But uh, it was in South Africa, close to Cape Town. And uh, we actually dropped the cage to the bottom. <clears throat> I'd seen sharks plenty of times from the boat and all that. And once we got into the cage and lowered it to the bottom, uh, it became a whole different ball game. Like you, you it, when you're watching TV and in these films and whatnot, you hear a lot of music and you sometimes hear a pterodactyl or a T-Rex in the background randomly and all these sound effects underwater. You really only hear your own breathing. And when you hear your own breathing, you're like, all right, okay, I got to calm down here. I, I'm, I'm breaking my rules. I got to stay calm. But then as the first shark approached, uh, it, it wasn't menacing. It wasn't like, didn't have this like, Oh, it's coming to get me. It was more like almost it was more curious and almost more more afraid of me. It came in and looked in there and it kept its distance, swam by, it circled around and then it came back and then it came like straight in where you get that that whole like right, right, basically this logo coming right at you. And it just came in and then it before it got about, I don't know, five, five feet away, it, it almost got spooked. It kind of like, oh turned around and they can turn on a dime. They have amazing agility and maneuverability, but it came in, checked me out and then turned off and it only made like two passes and then it disappeared. Kind of like, ah, I'm bored with you guys. I'm going to go look for seals. But it was, uh, you know, a pretty heart pumping uh, moment, but more so like in complete awe because, um, you know, they're, they're bigger and, and just larger than life when you see them in real life. And they were just so polite like most people think they're going to rush out of nowhere and, and try to bite your head off. Again, I, as I said, I've been diving with white sharks for 20 years now, all over the world, murky water, deep water, shallow. Uh, I always try to not dive in the murky water and somehow I end up doing it. Um, but yeah, they're just really polite, intelligent and majestic predators. And I, I love them more than anything, but not more than my wife and kids. I'm sure they're watching. You better be. And uh, you mentioned they were watching. So yeah, nice save. Nice save. <laughs> So, uh, hey, on that note, so you mentioned your shark safety tips and everything. And so I, I've got a quick, uh, we talked about this before. I actually watched a friend get bit by a shark one time. It was a nurse shark. And uh, and it was because they were throwing feeder fish. We're on a snorkeling trip and they were throwing fish to keep right. the sharks interested because they don't have any real natural interest in humans, right? You said, you know, shark swims up to you to see what you are, realizes, I don't care about that. Like, I don't care about Andy. I'm going to go somewhere else. And so the, you know, the boat captain was throwing fish out there to keep them around. Well, he reached up because somebody threw him a camera to take a picture. Shark thinks it's a fish and latches onto his hand. But to your point of, you know, they don't want us. They don't have taste for us. Immediately, you know, kind of it, it barely broke the skin jumped off and swam away. And so, uh, so sample size of one, but I have seen it happen. And right away, the shark knew he wanted nothing to do with my friend, Mark. Uh, and by the end of the week, we were away for a week. He realized like, you know, the scab was healing and he wasn't, nobody back home was going to believe him that he had gotten bitten by a shark. But, um, <laughs> I swear it yeah, we kind of like you got to open that up, man. You got to open that. But but to your point, they um they, they're not after us. They you know these yeah. were nurse sharks. They weren't after him. It was a yeah. total mistake and identity thing, and it realized it right away. So um, just to talk really quick about that, I was just at a shoot with this guy Mark Rober. He's an amazing amazing engineer, big time YouTuber, NASA engineer, and uh, we were taking him on a shark dive, and also this guy Noah Schnapp from Stranger Things. And uh, right before we went on the dive, I was like, oh, I should tell these guys because we were with reef sharks and. Uh, it's a baited scenario. They're there snapping. They are, they are hunting, but they really just want to get fish. But occasionally when people do get bit by sharks, just like you said, most of the damage that happens is when the person pulls their hand out of the mouth because they're freaked out. I told them, listen, I know this is counterintuitive, but if a shark does happen to bite down on your hand, because most of these sharks, um, and if your hands are all moving around and you're not wearing gloves, I said, don't pull it away. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to release right away. If you pull it away, you're going to do more damage. And, and, you know, the director's like, Andy, don't say this stuff. You're freaking out our talent. And then Mark and Noah are like, no, no, this is really important. Like, it is counterintuitive. Like, I would have probably pulled away, and you probably just saved my hand if anything bad happened. So it's counterintuitive, but relax. Obviously, if the shark starts to really get in there. But anyway, I'm not going to freak you out here. But stay calm. Usually it's mistaken identity. 
they bite and spit. And really, it's it's a mistake that you make. You're throwing a camera or bait or you're in a situation where sharks are frenzied. You're playing with fire a bit. So that's that was a good story that you uh, a way to, you know, kind of relate to. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I don't get to tell it enough anymore. But it was it was a pretty amazing experience. And also just, you know, snorkeling with sharks was, you know, it's amazing to see them up close and just how how powerful they are, how fast they are um, and all that kind of a thing, too. That leads to another huge genre of questions. And guys, keep your questions coming. We've uh, we've you know loved seeing all those questions. There's people want to say, OK, Andy says, stay calm. If I'm around, if I see a shark in the water, stay calm, stay calm. How do you stay calm? Right. Like your, your initial fight or flight reflex. And so you've done it. So I think that's kind of the, the other big line of questioning is, okay, but how do you do that? So there's really no substitute for experience. I just talked about my first experience with the great whites and I, I, I was, you know, my heart was pumping. I, I was, you know, kind of like doing my best to stay calm. The reality is like you, it's okay to be a little bit, you know, a little bit nervous just don't show that fear. Don't swim away. If you, even Michael Phelps, I worked with Phelps. He's the fastest dude in the world and amazing Olympian. <clears throat> Nobody can outswim him, but a shark can certainly catch him. A shark can outswim him. We took him to dive with great whites and he knew that right away. Hey, I'm not going to try to, you know, I'm not going to try to outswim a great white. So the reality is it's okay to be a little afraid, a little scared, especially if it's your first time. But the time, the times I've taken people shark diving, and they're fearful at first. Once they get in the water and they see the sharks swimming around them and they're polite and they're like, wow, their minds are blown. They're like, these are the most amazing predators on earth. Like they, they, it's really about experience. So like anything else, I'm sure the first time you learn to drive a car, you're nervous because you don't want to crash. The first time you go shark diving, it might be nervous because everything you've learned or heard or seen. Um, and the reality is with experience, with time, um, you, you'll no longer feel nervous. You're more excited. You're more, and, you know, like I said, if you are a little nervous, just don't show it. Just stay calm. I often have a camera in my hands, too. So if it gets a little dicey, I use it as a shield. Uh, and the reality is, like, you can, if, if the sharks are a little too interested, you can push them down on the way. The trick is just to not let their teeth make contact with their skin and everything's fine. I know that sounds almost impossible, but it's not. And most of the times the sharks uh, are not going to try to bite you. They're more curious. If there's a big bloody fish there, don't, you know, swim over to it and grab it and try to pull it away from the shark or wrap it around your neck. Just use common sense and you should be fine. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, having a camera would, uh, we saw some pictures of that. I think uh, in here too, that's so having cameras, a shield is a pretty good idea. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned experience that's learning is, uh, is all about, you know, like understanding situations before you're in them. So you know how to react. So a, a good plug there for, uh, for just learning in general, please do another one. We actually have a bunch of teachers in the, uh, the audience here. And thanks to all of you for asking who wanted to know, like, Hey, we want to teach people about the importance of sharks to the ecosystem. Some of the things you talked about there, um, are there any resources or, or things you would want people to check out to learn a little bit more, you know, particularly teachers who want to bring it into the classroom, you know, help, help people understand why sharks are so important and what we can do to, to help keep the world habitable for them. Yeah, there's a lot of good uh, organizations out there. Uh, one of my favorites is Sea Legacy, um, a really great group of people doing amazing conservation work. They have a lot of good information. There's a really good book called The Collins Guide to Sharks. It has everything from amazing illustrations to almost every species, and it gives you great detail on what part of the world they live. What do they feed on? How big do they grow? It's essentially like an encyclopedia for sharks, the Collins Guide, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. Uh, Google it, check it out. It's available everywhere, I'm sure. Uh, there's even like a pocket version. I have a bunch of them. So there's the big version, there's a pocket version, there's ones with cool pictures. Um, some really good scientific papers, but they're sometimes hard to digest. Um, uh, you can read the abstracts like I do, but uh, I would say, um, and also, you know, Google, uh, you know, there's a lot of mixed information you're going to get out there, but if it's from a reputable source, like say National Geographic, Oceana, the Smithsonian Society, Discovery, these, these places, as long as it's vetted and, you know, do a few searches, like uh, try to try to, and scientific papers really are the ones that are validated. They're peer reviewed, you know, and, and talk to scientists. I mean, I would be happy to do more, more classes. And I've done a lot of talks at my kids' schools and uh, they think it's really fun and they learn a lot. And they ask a lot of the similar questions like, what do I do if a shark's trying to bite me? What do I do if, uh, if I see a shark and uh, where do they live? But um, 
I would say the Collins Guide is one of my favorites, uh, and it, it's great for teaching because it has a lot of data as well. And, um, yeah, it's really good. Awesome. Thank you. And, and actually, that leads to where you say you'd be happy to do more classes. We've had a bunch of questions coming in. Will Andy be doing more classes? The answer is yes. Uh, he's back at least once more in the fall to talk about, uh, you know, wildlife cinematography. So we've got that to look forward to. I know a few people were asking about that. We'll have a whole class on that here coming up soon. And uh, Andy did some uh, some video lesson work for us uh, that's part of Wildlife Preacher Camp. So if you click that link on the screen, uh, you can go in and find. We got some uh, some you know mini lessons and quizzes and all those kind of things that Andy was a part of. So if you want more Andy Casagrande, there's uh, plenty more where that came from here at Varsity Tutors and elsewhere. We'll have your Instagram handle up here in just a second. Um, let's go maybe two more if you've got time for two more questions for us. One sure. another really popular one was let's just hear most memorable. We talked we talked about your first uh, you know shark encounter. What's your most memorable shark encounter and uh, what can you tell us about it? So my most memorable, I briefly touched on it when I'm, I joked about Tom and Jerry, these two sharks that I'm convinced are brothers. I was in uh, Western Australia working on a shark week film and I was down on the bottom at about 70 feet. I got outside of the cage because the visibility was really clear. The sharks were relaxed. I was feeling good. I was excited. And I got out and these two sharks, these two male sharks, uh, almost immediately, they, 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 I saw them from a distance and they were swimming side by side. And it's not uncommon to see uh, sharks kind of in, in, a, in loose groups and aggregations. Some sharks by the thousands, even off here in Florida, you get all these sharks. But uh, these two great whites are swimming up to me and they, they go and they swim right over top of my head. And then the, the, uh, I was like, oh, that was an amazing shot. And then they swim down and then they come back and they're still in this perfect unison. And then they come back again in this perfect for formation, even closer, close enough that I could pat the belly of one of them. And I did it on purpose to let it know like, hey, I know you're getting a little closer. I'm aware of that because sometimes sharks, when they're hunting prey, they'll pretend they're not interested. They're relaxed. They're cool. And then they'll switch it on. So these guys are coming around and then they – they just would never leave each other's side. I then went back 14 months later and found these same two great white sharks still with each other. Everyone believes, everyone knows that uh, mammals have family units. Humans do, dolphins do, whales do. Sharks are often categorized as these lonely lords of the sea and they, they, there's no paternal, maternal instinct. You're born and you're on your own and all this stuff. And a lot of that may, or, well, not a lot of that. Some of that is true, but the reality is I believe that sharks live in these uh, in these brotherhoods, sisterhoods. They The area that we were diving in is a known pupping ground close by. And as I mentioned before, they can have up to 14 to 15 pups at the same time. If you're born with 14 other brothers and sisters on the same reef, you're bound to bounce into them again. And hey, Billy, where are you going? Tommy, I'm over here. Gina, what, like it makes sense that they would hang out for cooperation, safety in numbers. They could have cooperative hunting. So um, we're still working on proving this, uh, getting the DNA to prove that these guys are brothers, they're related, they're best friends, what it is. But that was the most memorable shark dive of my life. I believe it's on YouTube. If you, or if you just Google great white brothers, great white shark brothers, you will see, um, you'll probably see the shot, two sharks swimming around me multiple times. And um, again, we went back and found those same sharks. I have dreams about those sharks. Um, and I will go back and one day, uh, prove that they are brothers. Uh, I know some scientists are like, hey, man, you can't say that. There, there might just be, you might have just got lucky. And hey, it is true. You need the scientific method to prove things. You can't just, you know, but it was a very memorable dive for me. Seeing them again a year and a half later just blew my mind. And um, yeah, I think they're much uh, cuter and cuddlier than most people think. They can be dangerous, but they're very polite and majestic, amazing animals. Awesome. What a cool story. I love that, uh, that you've gotten to know Actually, those. That was one of my favorite things we talked about. You've there, gotten to there's a, yeah, sorry. There's the, uh, there's a frame grab. This is the, obviously the, like the card, the signed card I'll, I'll send you guys. And, but that's a frame grab from the moment of the two brothers. And uh, you can see me there. I'm, my, my head's about to explode just cause I'm like, I mean, I've had a lot of close encounters with sharks, but I had never seen them so relaxed and so cooperative and, and like, just like jet fighters, just cruising along side by side, like, like perfect twins. It, it was amazing. That's incredible. Well, 
got to work together just like the sharks do. Uh, you mentioned the scientific method and going back and discovering more things about sharks kind of leads us to our last question. we got a lot of kids out here that look to you and say, this guy's got the coolest job in the world um, and is clearly passionate and excited about it, loves doing it every day. Kids who would love to work with sharks and, and other, you know, kind of marine life and all those kind of things. What's your advice to somebody who's maybe 10 years old today, eight years old today, thinking about, man, I would love to have a job like that when I grow up. What's, what's your advice to those kids? What should they be thinking about today? So back to what I said before, <clears throat> try to learn as much as you possibly can from books, from the internet, from your teachers, from people like me. Contact people like me that are doing what you want to do. If I wanted to be an astronaut, I would be calling SpaceX. I would be calling NASA. I would, if I, like... Try. There's so it's so easy now to connect with people through social media, through emails, through digital communication. Uh, you can also write a letter, but um, you'd be surprised at how um, how open people can be. I know, like, you know, trying to get in touch with a Hollywood actor can be really tough, but um, people that are passionate, people that care about uh, spreading the knowledge, inspiring other people, which I definitely do. Uh, I get this question all the time. And there's amazing research teams. Like as a 10-year-old kid or a 7-year-old kid, um, ask your teacher about, hey, what kind of programs do we have here in math and science and things that I can learn uh, or even engineering to I have a ton of cameras here and things that I build with my own hands. I go to Home Depot or whatever, I buy some random stuff and build my own stuff. I learn a lot of things through the Internet, through people that I worked with. So, uh, And there's amazing research teams along the coast of California and Florida if you're interested in shark research in the U.S., there's online camera courses. I never took an official camera course. I never actually planned to become a filmmaker. I always wanted to be a marine biologist, a scientist. But as I studied more in school and as I traveled, I started and I was working with scientists. I realized I had skills more in the realm of uh, storytelling and filmmaking and less in um, in writing papers and, and conducting the, the minute details and all the things that are required for great science. That's really important. We need people to do that. I think some of you should do that. Uh, but for me, it was the path that I took. Um, I was working for a research team in Cape Town as a, a volunteer uh, research assistant taking dorsal fin photographs. Like the photograph behind me of that great white coming out of the water, I was really focused on dorsal fins, but then it started gaping and, and showing its teeth. So by mistake, uh, National Geographic, not by mistake, National Geographic came down to make a documentary about what we were doing. And they saw that I was crazy and passionate and good at taking pictures and they offered me a job and that's how I got started. So I moved from a research realm to a filmmaking realm, but now I've mixed the two in cinema science. I run expeditions. I take people, teach them about science. I teach them about technology, engineering, cameras, sharks, research. I love it. I'm going to do it um, forever, forever. So yeah. You can hit me up with questions, but I'm going to tell you to try to look into research teams, read books, learn as much as you can, and find a way to specialize in something that you love, that you're passionate about, and, and try a number of things. Like I said, I never planned to become a filmmaker. It almost happened by, by mistake, but it's been one of my greatest mistakes. That's amazing. Really, really good advice out there. You know, I think I think one thing I took from that is, you know, don't assume that by going to school every day, you know, that your dream job is going to come find you. Um, go right. out, reach out to people who have jobs like you want to do. Um, you know, you know, things like you mentioned, online camera courses and things. Find other ways to get involved. Make it happen for yourself, yeah. and don't be afraid to to try new things, meet new people. Um, you know, sort of that serendipity with National Geographic, like you were out there making things happen. So, um, yeah. amazing advice. Hey, thank. Thanks so much. Um, speaking of online camera courses, you've got that coming up with our city tutors here uh, a little bit later yeah. on this fall. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, thanks, Andy, for amazing class, amazing insight. Uh, we Thank know a lot you. more sharks. Might know. I think just more about being enthusiastic about your life, which is great too. So amazing advice. Thanks to all of you guys out there for, uh, for all of your uh, incredible questions. We're psyched to see those pictures up online. And so with that, let me make sure we give you guys those official handles. I know Andy mentioned, reach out to him. If you've got questions on those kind of things, here's one way to get at him with the, uh, the Instagram here. This is uh, who you can tag with, uh, with your photos on Instagram to win uh, spot and wildlife creature camp autographed hat, autograph picture, all those cool things. So uh, we'll leave you with that. Uh, Andy, we'll see you back here in the fall. Everybody else will see you back here, hopefully even sooner than that. And take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Live the life you dream. Have a good one.